morning and welcome to Whitehall on a terrible wintry day where the weather has brought most of the UK to a standstill. But the National Health Service has to work 24-7 and today I'm delighted to welcome Professor Sir Bruce Keel, who's the Medical Director of the National Health Service. Good morning Bruce. Let me start as I usually do by asking you to tell us a little bit about why you became a doctor. Well, when I was a kid, about four, I, I fell out of a tree and uh, had some orthopaedic injuries, as, uh, as kids frequently do. And I was looked after very well, firstly by my GP and, uh, and secondly by the orthopaedic surgeons. And all boys of that age are interested in matters mechanical. And I got fascinated by um, the contraptions that I saw around on an orthopaedic ward and in the clinic and things. And that really made me become increasingly interested in, in medicine in general. And initially I wanted to be an orthopaedic surgeon, of course. I was quite convinced, though, by the age of seven that I, uh, that I wanted to be a doctor. And I think that was driven largely um, by the compassion that I saw and, and the care that I received from my general practitioner. So he was probably the major influence in that. And then I toyed over the years with what I wanted to do, but I consistently wanted to be a doctor apart from, from about a, a few months of delusion where I thought I'd make a fantastic NASA astronaut. Um, but I was brought up in what was then Rhodesia, is now Zimbabwe. And uh, in the late 1960s, of course, the first uh, human heart transplant was done in Cape Town, and that attracted a lot of, a lot of press interest. So it was then that I started to think about, uh, about heart surgery, which is where I ended up. Um, the other thing that, of course, attracted, to me, attracted me to that particular specialty was a, a good mixture of kind of technical surgical aspects and, and medicine and physiology. And Bruce, tell me how you managed to achieve your ambition of becoming a cardiac surgeon. Well, during my um, house jobs, one of which I, I did in Windsor, I spent some time speaking to, uh, to one of the cardiologists at a local hospital in that. That clarified my thoughts that cardiac surgery will f would fulfill my ambition of doing a specialty which was uh, both technical and medical and physiological at the same time. So after I had worked on the accident service in Oxford, I applied for an SHO job at the Hammersmith, and I thoroughly in, enjoyed that. Uh, I then went on to, uh, to do some general surgical training uh, up in Sheffield, and subsequently came back to the Hammersmith as a, as a registrar. I spent some time as a British Heart Foundation Junior Research Fellow in um, um, cardiac surgery, but actually did my, uh, my MD thesis in angioplasty, which is a kind of interesting contradiction, if you like. I then went on to a uh, senior registrar rotation uh, around London, which took me to the Harefield and St George's and then back to the Harefield. And then I w went on to become a senior lecturer at the Hammersmith Hospital. I did that for about five years. Um, but one of the things about being a senior lecturer is that it should lead on to a chair eventually, and there were no uh, chairs coming up in the foreseeable future or even the medium-term future in, uh, in the UK. So I transferred to the NHS and moved up to... Uh, to Birmingham, where I spent about 10 years in cardiac surgery before coming to join you again, Jean, at the, uh, at the Heart Hospital as, as part of UCL. Now, Bruce, you were brought up in Rhodesia, in a country of great inequality at that time. Were there experiences that you had at that time that influence you even now? I've developed a very significant interest in, in social inequalities. And I think it was brought to a head for me um, in Harare one day, I was walking down towards the, the hospital, which was a white hospital that I was functioning as a porter in, and a black African guy got knocked off his motorbike. Uh, not, not his motorbike, got knocked off his, uh, his bicycle. And an ambulance came, picked him up, and instead of taking him to a casualty department, which was only a few hundred yards away, drove him to the other side of the city. Now, I'll never know whether that had any impact on his survival but it did strike me as a, as a great injustice that somebody was uh, subjected to that when, when care was just around the corner. At one point, all my funds were frozen. And because I was at university, I had a room in a hall of residence where I could live, but I had no money for food. And it's, it's easy to imagine that in modern Britain, that if you genuinely don't have money for food, that somehow or other there's some support to help you. Well, it became clear to me uh, that there wasn't. My bank account had been frozen uh, as part of, of sanctions against uh, Rhodesia. 
Um, I didn't have a national insurance number. I wasn't entitled to any help from Social Security. So I went through a period where I found myself scavenging for food. I, I applied for uh, two jobs in particular where I failed the medical because they said I just didn't look fit enough, and that was frankly because I wasn't eating properly. But one place, British Steel, where I went to, um, I was sent off for a medical, and the doctor said to me, "Look, you know, you're you're not eating properly. You're you're not fit. We can't we can't give you this job." And I explained my predicament to him, and I'm, the guy showed enormous compassion. Actually, once once he realised what the problem was, spoke to the managers, and they paid me a week in advance and told me just to go off, eat, and have food, and uh, and that had quite a formative influence on the way I look at people in society now who who appear to be to be struggling um, with material things because the blockages and the, the obstacles towards, I, I guess, progressing are not always what they seem. That's just one of, of many examples which, which have made me have a deep sense of concern really for, for the social inequalities that exist, not just in Africa, but exist even in this city of, of London. You know, if you get on the on the Jubilee Line at Westminster, which is where we are now, and you travel down to North Greenwich, the life expectancy drops by seven years. And I'm sure that's not different from any other metropolitan areas. But the problem is not only do those people live, have a life expectancy of seven years shorter, but they also um, have a much greater preponderance of, uh, of long-term illness and, uh, and disability. Bruce, were there any people or experiences that really influenced you as you began to train, or even before that time? When I was, I suppose, around about, around about 11, and through a, uh, a series of circumstances, I discovered that my, my mother had cancer. And um, she and I sat down and we, we spoke about it. And one of the things she said to me was, look, the doctors and your dad and I have agreed that it's not fair for you to know this. And um, she said, I'd be grateful if you, know, you just kept this between you and me, which I did. But it was quite difficult because it meant that I didn't have anybody else that I could go and talk to initially. And that made me think quite a lot about barriers and barriers that that sort of communication or lack of communication puts up, not just between individuals, but within families, which have the potential for actually doing exactly the opposite of what they're meant to do. So that position that I found myself in um, had been inflicted on me out of what loving and caring people thought were my best interests. But in fact, in reality, uh, it wasn't a, a, an effective uh, strategy. And that influenced me quite significantly in terms of, of being honest and straight with patients. And I think that was tested at one particular point at the, when I was an SHO at the Hammersmith Hospital. Um, working in surgery and a young girl came onto the ward and she had cancer of the, uh, of the bile duct, I think. And the, my boss said to me, under no circumstances must you tell her that she has cancer. I promised her mum that no one will tell her that. And I said to him, so Prof, I, can, I can't promise that I won't do that, but what I can promise is that I will um, that I won't raise the issue. But if she asks me directly, I must tell her the truth. And that particular position was born directly out of my experiences um, as, a, as a boy. In the event, she did ask me directly, do I have cancer? And I said yes. And a very difficult process lasting about six weeks ensued following that where, um, um, where I was the subject of, of investigation and criticism uh, for that particular action, um, which clearly produced a, a polarized view within that particular circle about whether I'd done the right thing or not. I'm utterly convinced I did do the right thing because she was asking me because she couldn't get the answers out of others. And Bruce, you now live and work in London. You came here about four or five years ago, a big change. How do you manage to get a good balance between your family life and your very demanding work here? Well, my kids have grown up now and if they haven't flown the nest they're in the process of doing so. My wife has got quite a busy job and when I indicated to her that I was interested in moving down to London she, sa she said to me, um, 
quite clearly, and I remember it very well. She said, I don't want you gallivanting around with your friends during the week in London um, and then coming back and catching up on your work at home at the weekends. She said, so you're very welcome to go, but the weekends belong to us. And actually, we did that, and it was, it was a fantastic discovery because while I'd been living and working in Birmingham, I worked a lot at the weekends on various things ranging from clinical issues, but predominantly uh, around uh, professional things. I, I had a, a significant role in the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery and did some work for the Royal College of Surgeons and so forth. So a lot of that stuff was done at the weekends. But once I'd come to this agreement with my wife, I put the weekends aside for the family and it was fantastic. Um, so now I think my work life balance is, is pretty good. I work hard during the week and um, give the weekends over to, to the family and myself. Bruce, thank you very much for those insights. Very useful, very interesting. Thank you. Gene, an absolute pleasure as always to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed.